Society of Antiquaries for anyone here who doesn't know who we are. Um, as Julian said, we're one of the oldest learned societies in the UK. We were founded in 1780, incorporated by Royal Charter in 1783, and our purpose is to investigate both antiquities and natural and civil history in general with the intention that the talents of mankind should be cultivated and the study of natural and useful sciences should be promoted. Um, that's since been updated in our laws, I think sometime in the early 1800s, to say that our purpose is specifically the study of Scotland through its archaeology and history. So that's, we've moved a little bit away from the life sciences, but um, we're still trying to maintain that wide antiquarian tradition. And, and this is a, a recent update to Scotland's impact on civilization. <laughs> um, recently spotted in, in Waterstones. We look to Scotland for all our ideas of civilization in Voltaire. <laughs> we're trying to uphold those ideals. I'm not sure how well we're doing. <laughs> um, and we've also had a long relationship with the ADS. In 1999, we started a scanning project for our proceedings. In 2001, we started an online-only open access journal um, called Scottish Archaeological Internet Reports, which I'll refer to as SARE, because um, Scottish Archaeological Internet Reports is far too long to say. Uh, and at the moment, all of our out-of-print books, um, all of our SARE journals, all of our proceedings archive is all available on the ADS. Um, for the proceedings, everything that's more than a year old is freely available. So it's quite a huge quantity of data um, and information. Um, one of the reasons that we started Scottish Archaeological Internet Reports is that um, it's particularly suited for very long reports, things that are just not very effective to produce in print. Um, so you can see, sort of, these are fairly early versions of SARE, um, and we're currently working on redeveloping it so that it's a little bit more useful for you know, modern scholars, because I don't think we've really changed the format since 2001. <laughs> um, but you can see huge quantities of data with things like um, lithics, we had an Aaron Pitchertone guest here. Um, <coughs> Scotland's first settlers project ended up being, I think, close to 500,000 words, and just an uncountable number of images. So really a very huge amount of data. Um, just to give you a quick overview of our, our long publications timeline. So we started the proceedings in 1793. Um, our first monograph in 1982 started scanning the proceedings in 99. Scottish Archaeological Internet Reports, and that brings us up to today, where last year, in 2015, we started what we've been calling the Go Digital Project, because we got funding from Publishing Scotland um, and they called it the Go Digital Project. <laughs> so that's been our working name. And the idea behind the project um, is really to allow the society to move to full open access. So obviously, as I've said, quite a bit of our information is already available on um, the ADS. One of our problems is that we are still printing the proceedings. And as a small independent publisher, we don't have the resources to keep printing the proceedings. It's very expensive for us. Um, so you can see here, I haven't given the exact figures, but roughly the printing and distribution costs combined total about 85% of our yearly cost of the proceedings. It's only 15% of the cost that's everything else, the editing, the typesetting, the, you know, just the time involved in getting the work done. Um, so while we have hundreds of volumes of these very nice printed books, the unfortunate fact is that we're spending a lot of money printing about 3,000 copies of the proceedings every year. We know from the download figures that people who are looking at these online, um, we're getting huge, much larger numbers of people looking at this information online. So it's a very ineffective way for us to disseminate information. Print is very limited in its scope and our online audience is much bigger. So that's fine. Um, 
council has finally agreed that this is a, a direction that we'd like to pursue, but we still have to convince our fellows um, who tend to be older and maybe a bit conservative who really like print. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to communicate is why this move is better, why it's better for authors, because they get um, much higher page views, they get a lot more eyeballs on their research. Um, why it's better for researchers, one of the things that we want to do, which I'll be talking about in a minute, is improving things like our search functionality within our own archives. Um, and it's better for the community because what we hope to do is invest some of the money that we're saving on print into our own publications and the rest of the money we're hoping to um, invest into our research grants budget. So that money will be going directly back into the community. We're not hoarding it. <laughs> um, and we feel like as a very small budget organization, you know, we don't have a lot of money to play with. So we do have an obligation to make sure that that money is going to where it can be used most effectively. And we feel that this is the way that we can do that. So um, I know our previous speaker said that open access is easy. Um, which I think can be true. <laughs> um, for a small organization, it might not always be so easy. Um, as an independent publisher, um, we needed to find out how we can take this project forward. Because what we need to do is if we're telling people, actually, you can no longer have print copies of this journal that you've been receiving for years. But what we're going to give you instead is better functionality. We're going to give you um, a better search function, a better reader experience, more linking, um, all of these kinds of things. But there's only, oh, there's an image mission missing. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> but we've only got very limited staff time, and we only have very limited res resources. So we need to find a way to make these big changes happen. Um, and so Emma and I have come up with this pilot project, which we've been informally calling the Go Digital Project. And we're looking at the out-of-print books, which, of which there are less than 30. Um, these have already been digitized. The PDFs are available on the Archaeology Data Service. Um, it's a small scale number of publications, but the content is complex. So that means that we can use it to create a methodology that we can also use on our proceedings archives, on our SARE publications, um, so that we can roll out this um, enhanced functionality throughout all of our publications over time. Oh, there's my picture. <laughs> it was worth waiting for, huh? <laughs> uh, this is really just emphasizing the fact that um, some of this material is born digital. Um, we, we already have the digital versions. But these are actually CDs from the original scanning project in 1999. And this is a handwritten guide to what's on the CDs and all of the file types. So this has been a project that's very long in the making. <laughs> um, OK, so for our first phase of the pilot project, we're really trying to focus on what we need. And um, we'll be talking about what we want in a minute, but we have to look at just what we need. So what we need is book or article level DOIs. Um, we need increased search functionality. And what we'd like to do is ensure that that search functionality happens on the Society of Antiquaries website, although it will be searching ADS material. Um, because we already have quite a few other bits of resources on the Society of Antiquaries website, we want an integrated search so that people can look through everything we have at once and find what they're looking for. Um, and also links to Canmore, to ADS um, data, to anything that's immediately obvious as being a good linking methodology. So here you can see we started with the moon and the bonfire. And although I think my name's up in that corner, this is actually Emma's HTML because I'm not very good at HTML. <laughs> um, and that was our first step, was basically just breaking down the, the text back into HTML um, and chunking down the individual um, sections of the text, finding out what elements were common, so headings, how do we deal with headings, how do we deal with tables, how do we, do we deal with illustrations. Um, here you can see we've done a bit of linking already to Canmore sites, um, the things that were quite obviously and easily findable. So that project, that bit of the project is phase one. 
that's what we're thinking of as the pilot project. And that's ongoing. It's not finished yet, but believe me, you will all hear about it when it is. <laughs> um, but the next phase is what do we want? So we've talked about what we need, but long term, we know that this project is going to have many phases. Um, and we're just, it's going to have to be something that we're continuously revising and coming back to. So we want to be part of the directory of open access journals um, because, again, that will increase the visibility of our material. Uh, we want to link in with author ORCID IDs. Uh, we want better analytics. I think there's an image missing again, um, which is something else that we want. Um, the Open Library of the Humanities is another thing that we would like to link into. The great thing about open access publication is that um, there are lots of different services for people to find your material. And for many of our authors, the biggest challenge is that just their, people aren't seeing what they're publishing. So we're hoping that this move will be a, a massive change in um, the level of uh, visibility that their publications get. <coughs> and so at the bottom, I've kind of stolen a very common um, image that's used in lean methodologies, if any of you are familiar with that management style, which is basically the idea is not to have one massive project that has a finite start date and a finite end date, and we put all of this emphasis into it and all of this time into it, and then it's finished, and then we don't come back to it. Um, our plan is to simply do each phase, um, think about what we need, design it, get feedback, see what's working, see what's not working, um, and then start the next phase, and so it's an iterative process. We're continually refining what we're doing. Ah, and there we go. So this is the other thing we want, is a map interface. Um, and we've been working with um, the University of Edinburgh's informatics department to get some of this natural language processing of place names predominantly. Um, and you can see this is a very early version of what a map might look like. The biggest challenge here is that all of that information needs to be human checked. Um, it's good, it's about 75% accurate, but it's not quite good enough. So we need to find a way to create an army of interns that can <laughs> check all of this data for us, um, which is why it's not in phase one. So um, the other challenge that we had was, what do we call this collection? And we had a lot of chat about it in the office. And we had a Twitter competition, I think, as well. And in the end, what we came up with was the Smelly Collection. <laughs> um, and that's named after William Smelly, who was our superintendent of natural history in the late 1700s. He was also the creator of the very first Encyclopedia Britannica. And so we thought that he was a, a, a willing, a, a worthy person to name this new um, project after. So there you go. That's your exclusive. We've decided to call it the Smelly Collection. <laughs> um, OK, so that is me finished. And I'd like to thank you. Um, this is how you can contact Emma and I. And you'll notice that my email address is not at the Society of Antiquaries. I've actually just started working for Wiley about a month ago. Um, I will continue working on the pilot project with the Society of Antiquaries, um, and then hopefully we'll get it to a point where it can be handed off and continue to be worked on. Thank you.